Yes, we did it. We made it to the weekend and I am so excited about church this weekend for another great message in the book of John. Hopefully you've been enjoying this series. I mean, how can you not? It's the words of Jesus. That's good stuff. Well, man, we've gotten some important things in store for you today. First off, my name is Trent Jenkins. I'm our online community pastor. I'm privileged to be able to be with you today. And so fun continuing to hear the stories coming in from people all over the country. We just found out a new group watching in Ohio. We had an amazing time in Sacramento last week at a worship gathering. And so many more of you across the country tuning in. Thank you so much. We have some important things for you. The first one is life groups. We always talk about it. Life groups is the key way to get plugged in here at North Coast Church. And today is no different. Check out this video. The following is an advertisement for life groups brought to you by North Coast Church. Meet Carl. Carl can't seem to ever get things right. When he's out grilling with his buddies, his burgers are always catching fire. Wow. That looks very dangerous. What a gross mess. Yard work is always an endless hassle. His tangled hose is just too much. And when it comes to shaving, forget about it. Take a look at that hack job. Crazy Carl just seems to have really bad luck. He can't even start a lawnmower without it exploding in his face. Carl knew he had to make a big change. So he came alongside the thousands of happy North Coasters and joined a life group Designed to foster meaningful relationships centered on God's Word, life groups meet throughout the week. They help to strengthen your walk with God and get you living out what you learned on the weekend. I gotta say, ever since I joined that life group, things have been looking up. I don't get hurt as much. I make a mean burger. I'm super confident in priming my lawnmower. Life's great. <laughs> Join a life group where you get the support you need to make it through life. To find a group that's right for you, simply go to our website and click on the Life Groups banner. There you're gonna be able to search for a group, whether you're in the San Diego area or if you're in a nationwide or online group, be sure to click on that button and there's groups specifically designed for you. Whether it's online or local in person for select areas, there's gonna be some groups on different times and nights. So hopefully there's a group that meets your needs. And if you're in the San Diego area, we have a number of groups that are close to our local campuses. We encourage you to get involved with one of those groups. Now let's go ahead and get ready for today's service. Make sure you download our message notes on our website. You can give online. Of course, you can always put in your prayer request or you can text it in right here on the screen. Thank you so much for being a part of North Coast Church. Without further ado, let's go into worship and then go into our message. Behold the wrath of God Pulled out on innocent blood Behold the righteous land Takes on the sin of the world Oh, broken and bruised Hold up and used The Lamb of God was there
prisoner of fear. Behold this grateful heart, forever devoted to thee. I give you my surrender. I will rise to bring you praise. And by your spirit, I will rise from the ashes of the feet. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name, I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected key is resurrecting me. The resurrected key is resurrecting me. Yeah. Oh, so I worship your name. Oh, we lift up your name. Your name, your name. Is victory. Our praise will rise to Christ our King. God, your name, your name is victory. Our praise will rise to Christ our King. Hey, it's good to be with you again. As we continue our study through the book of John, I first of all want to stop and say welcome to our, our newest campus, Temecula, out at Bella Vista Middle School. If you live in that area, give it a check out. Uh, we are so glad to be able to have this uh, new campus with us. But uh, today, uh, as, as we continue the study through John, I, I want to start out by reminding us of something very important, and that is that every book of the Bible has a purpose. You know, we often think of the Bible as a book, but it's actually a library of 66 different books and letters that were written. And until uh, Gutenberg came along, nobody thought of the Bible as a book. They thought of the Bible as a phrase for a collection of different books, uh, scrolls even way back in history that you would carry with you when you'd look at each one. Now, the problem is sometimes when we think of it as a book, we don't look at each individual letter or book through the eyes of who it was written to and why it was written, what we've come to call context. And that's such an important part of being able to understand the Bible, because every book, every letter was a real book or a real letter written to real people in a real situation with a purpose. And then God said, save it for all time for all of my people. But essentially, we're not reading something written to us. We're reading something saved for us. It's as if we're reading someone else's mail over their shoulder, and it's filled with truth. And then we're pulling out those truths that apply to us. But the starting point is always who wrote it and why was it written? Well, that's true with the Gospel of John. There are four Jesus stories in our Bible, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And all of them were written with a distinct purpose in mind. And so I just want to take a few moments and we're going to look back and, and, and see how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not biographies of Jesus. They're specific books written to specific audiences for a purpose. So first of all, let's think about Matthew for just a moment. Matthew was written to Jews, and it was written to prove to them that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Uh, it's not a chronological book. If you ever tried to read through the book of Matthew, compare it with the others, you go, wow, everything's out of order, because that's not what Matthew was doing. He was collecting Jesus's teachings, and then he was t uh, collecting the narratives or stories, and they're all themed. They kind of go together here, go together here back and forth, and he's not worried about the order of when they took place. He's grouping them by the major theme that they were under. 
And there are, because he's writing to Jewish people, showing that Jesus is the Messiah, there are 125 different Old Testament quotes and allusions that you are going to find in the book of Matthew. And then we come to the second one, which is called Mark. Now, Mark was written to Romans. And by the way, that's not everybody in the Roman Empire. They were, to Jews, Gentiles and, and, and people. But Romans were the people from Rome and that area of Italy. And they even to this day, uh, somebody will tell you, no, I'm not an Italian. I'm a Roman. It's a very distinct group of people. And that's who Mark was writing to, the, the government center, if you will, of the Roman Empire. And he's trying to prove to them that Jesus was the Son of God. And that's why he, along the way, explained certain Jewish traditions. Matthew wouldn't do that. He's writing to Jews. They know their traditions. But when you read Mark, it'll talk about the Passover, or it'll talk about the Pharisees, or, or a group of people, and it'll have a little parenthetical explanation of, of what this was about, because the Romans would know of the Jewish people, but they didn't know the Jewish traditions. Uh, traditions. And then Mark, at, at the end of his book, at the cru uh, crucifixion, he points out that it was a Roman soldier who said, truly, this must be the Son of God. And then we come to the third of the four Gospels, the one that we know as Luke. That was written to Gentiles, anybody who wasn't a Jew. And the whole purpose was to prove that Jesus was a real person not a Greek myth. Because if you know your history, the Roman Empire was built uh, upon or conquered, if you will, as a military power, the Greek world, but it adopted much of the uh, Greek language, Greek culture, and, and all that was involved with that. And, and they had this idea that their gods were, were made up of all these mythological figures. So Luke, the only Gentile to uh, uh, write as a part of the Bible, uh, Luke says and, and tries to prove to these folks that Jesus is the real deal. And so he emphasizes often his humanity as a God-man and tries to help them understand that he's not some myth. As, as even sometimes today people act like, well, Jesus is this mythological figure. No, he was a real deal. He was God in the flesh who uh, he, he wore diapers, he had to learn to talk, he had to learn to walk, he had to be educated. Uh, he lived a totally human life, setting aside his divinity. And that's what Luke is telling us. Um, he highlights over and over Jesus' conversations with people that weren't Jews, his love for mankind. And he points out that his book is written chronologically to prove a point. In fact, let's, let's put a passage up here from Luke that uh, you can see. Luke starts out by saying, many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. We have Matthew and Mark as two examples. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses, Matthew and, and Peter who informed Mark of his story, and they were servants of the word. With this in mind, I myself have, catch this, carefully investigated everything from the beginning I, too, also decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that's this, uh, who, the man who was his benefactor that he was uh, researching and writing for. Why? So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught, that this is not mythology, this is absolutely the real deal. So now... We come to John's purpose, the book that we have been studying. And his purpose is simply this, to show us that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and the only source of eternal life. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And he is the only, the only source of eternal life. We saw in the very beginning, I think it was Pastor Chris who put it up on the board in the first uh, message here on John, uh, a, a passage where John in chapter 20 explains exactly what he wrote. So let's take a look at it. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples. By the way, remember John is a book in a library. You read this at first, you think many other signs uh, which are not recorded in this book, you and I tend to think of the Bible, like all those uh, miracles and all that. Well, actually, there's only seven miracles in the book of John, just seven. 
because he's not telling all of Jesus's teachings. He's not telling all the things that Jesus did. He's just trying to point out he is the Messiah, he is God, and he is the source of eternal life. So Jesus performed many other miracles in the presence of the disciples, which aren't recorded in this book, book called John with only seven. But these seven are written, why? That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life, not this physical life that everybody has, but you might have eternal life in his name. He also said in, in John 14, 6, the famous passage that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. And yes, I noticed the typo that you just noticed. We'll get that fixed later. All right? So, why did I take so much time? Well, because I had a short sermon, I just wanted... No, no. The reason I took so much time is so that we can understand two well-known stories that we're going to look at, because John's emphasis isn't on the stories. What are the two known, well-known stories? Well, we're going to talk about Jesus feeding 5,000 people, a famous miracle if you've had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home uh, that Jesus did. It's in all four uh, Gospels. He fed 5,000 people with just a, a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And he walked on water, which is found in three of the Gospels. But unlike the others who kind of go in depth uh, and, and have different messages and things they're trying to communicate out of that, that, uh, those two stories, uh, John only has one point, and we're going to see it. And John's one point is simply this. Only God could do this. Only God could do this. Because remember, I'm writing so that you don't understand. He's a Messiah. He's the Son of God. And he's the source of eternal life. So his two accounts of the feeding of 5,000 as we look at it, and of what Jesus walking in water are, are shorter than the others. And they don't really have other messages for John. You know, so when the, the young boy shares his, his loaves of bread and his fish, uh, he, it's, it's not a lesson for us. Oh, if you give a little to God, God will turn it into much. Now, you might get that message out of it, and when you might see that in other places. But John, that's not what he's trying to point out. Oh, Jesus walking on water. And, and in the other accounts, uh, account, one of them, Peter gets out of the water, uh, uh, out of the boat and walks on the water. And then he takes his eyes off Jesus, gets frightened and sinks. And oh man, there's so many messages there. And yes, there are. But as we're going through John, that's not his message. He wants us to get one thing. Only God could do this. And then he's going to explain with the dialogue of Jesus what all of these miracles meant. Because all anybody saw at the surface was, wow, you can feed the crowds. Wow, you can walk on water. So with that long introduction, I know it, let's dig into this passage now and see what it says. And it starts with John chapter 6, starting at verse 1, Jesus is going to feed the 5,000. So here we go. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. The couple of the miracles that we've seen in the last few weeks. So that uh, uh, had gathered quite a crowd, as you can imagine. Well, Jesus then went up to the mountainside. He sat down with his disciples and the Jewish festival of Passover was near, which explains why the crowd was not only big because of the miracles, but it was big just to begin with. So it's a, a massive size crowd. Well, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, one of his 12 apostles, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. But Philip answered him, well, it would take more than a half year's wages, today's thirty to $50,000 to buy enough bread, not for them to eat, but catch this phrase, I love it, for each one to have just a bite. Would it cost that much? Like, we don't have that. What are we going to do? Well, another of his disciples or apostles, Andrew, who is Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up and he said, hey, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? And Jesus, who they had seen when the wine ran out, turned water into wine, 
once again, just tells everybody, okay, here's what to do. And he tells them all, I want you to sit down. And there was plenty of grass in the place, so they sat down. About 5,000 men were there, and Jesus took the loaves. He gave thanks for them and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, hey, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. <laughs> so he was the first. Well, no, we won't go there. Uh, so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with uh, five barley loaves and pieces of the fish that they had eaten. And then the passage goes on, and without any more detail, John says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is a prophet who is to come into the world. Well, you see, they knew that Moses had declared that another great prophet was going to come. I believe it's Deuteronomy 18. Uh, and he says, another prophet like me is going to come. And when he comes, listen to him. Now, what they thought is, wow, all of these signs and miracles like Moses had done, this is perhaps that other prophet, that Messiah, that deliverer, not yet the Son of God, not yet the source of eternal life in their mind, but this Messiah, like a second Moses, if you will. Now, here's a problem. They not only saw Moses as a miracle worker, they saw Moses as their great deliverer from 300 years of slavery in Egypt. So if indeed Jesus is like this second prophet, this second Moses that had been prophesied to come, then you know what? He's here to deliver us from the oppression of the Roman government, get us out of our slavery. And that, of course, is not what Jesus had come for. So that explains verse 15. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Well, when evening came that day, his disciples went down to the lake where they got in the boat and they set off across the lake for the other side, six miles away to Capernaum. And we're told in the other accounts that Jesus had told them, hey, you go ahead. So, so it's now evening, they're getting in a boat, they're going to row six miles to the other side. And it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. John tells us the strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. Not scary, we're going to drown rough, but making the rowing incredibly hard. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on water, and they were frightened. Duh. <laughs> now, uh, we are actually told from Mark that it was near dawn. So for hours they had been rowing, and because of the force of the wind and the rough waters, they had only made it barely halfway past. And Jesus, we're told in another account, was just like, well, I'm going to walk across the water and get over to the other side. And they saw him, and they freaked out that he was a, a, a ghost. But he said to them, hey, it's I, don't be, a, don't be afraid. <laughs> and then I love this. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. <laughs> Prior to that, it's like, ah, they probably started rowing a, a, a lot faster than they had ever rowed before. And then it says immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Boy, does he race through those two stories, doesn't he? Hey, he fed 5,000. Only guy could do this. And then he walked on water. Only guy could do this. Think about Moses. What did Moses do? If you know the story, for so many of you that are new and following Jesus, don't know the Old Testament story of Moses, he led them not only out of slavery in Egypt, he led them not only through the Red Sea, but as they wandered in the wilderness, there was a miracle of something called manna that was found every day on the ground, a miraculous uh, uh, provision of food from God through Moses. What had Jesus just done? Fed the people miraculously. What had Moses done with water? He parted it. What had Jesus done with water? He walked on it. See, Jesus is the Messiah. That's his main point. So the next day, we're told in verse 22, uh, the crowd that uh, had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and Jesus had not entered it with his disciples. So they're looking around for him. But uh, they couldn't find him. Verse 23 says, uh, some boats from uh, Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And they suddenly realized, oh, he's not here anymore. Neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. So they got into their boats and they went across to find him. Verse 25 says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? 
And Jesus answered, not with when he got there, but something much more important. Very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Now listen, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. See, John and Jesus, this isn't about filling your bellies. This isn't about getting you out from under Roman impression. This is about I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God, and I am the source of eternal life. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And so they asked him, okay, if we're looking for eternal life and you're the son of God, which a phrase son of man was a, a phrase Jesus used of himself to explain his humanity. What must we do to do the works that God requires? What do we do to have God's approval? What do we need for this eternal lasting life? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Everything has gone to that point. He's the Messiah, he's the son of God, and you need to believe in him because in him is found life. Now, this is a very long chapter. I'm not going to read it all. We might circle back and look at more detail. Uh, I really don't know at this moment. But just a little bit of a spoiler alert of what takes place in the next 40 verses. The crowd asked Jesus for more miracles. Like manna from heaven that Moses gave, can you give us more miracles so that we can believe? And Jesus says, no, you've already got enough. And I am the bread of life, not manna that you eat and you're hungry tomorrow, but the bread of life. If you metaphorically eat of my body and drink of my blood, if, if, if you take me in as your substance, I will satisfy every need you have forever. Well, the crowd, crowd hears him talking about eating his body and drinking of his blood, and it says they began to grumble that this is a teaching too hard. And racing all the way down to the bottom of this chapter, look at this and listen to this. Verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. See, they wanted a Messiah. They were okay with the Son of God. They were not okay with the one who's the source of eternal life. They wanted this life taken care of. So they no longer followed him. And so Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, well, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter, like always, the first to answer, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. You tracking with me? Is this making sense? It all flows together. These miracles that only God could do so that we might understand and believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and the source of eternal life. So what happens when the light goes on? When we realize that the Jesus story isn't a religious story, it's historical fact. You know, for me, I had the privilege of growing up in a great, great Christian home. Unfortunately, we went to a very jacked up church. And so I really didn't want much to do with Christianity or the church, not because of my parents or because of Jesus, but kind of a church environment I was in where they had more rules than, like Jesus could have never thought of that many rules. And so I didn't want anything to do with it. And I was, I was in high school and I was on some church camp that I, I went to and I was reading through the book of Matthew, uh, which was part of our assignment. And, and then it just hit me and my life was forever changed. Uh, I don't know whether it was something I responded to or something that God fully brought in. I just know the Spirit was at work in my life. And here's what happened. I'm reading it, and it just hit me. This isn't Bible truth. This is real truth. Like, this really happened. And from that point on, everything changed. Oh, I'm not saying I become some just perfect follower of Jesus. Any of you know me? No, that certainly wasn't what happened. But I want to tell you, my entire compass of my life shifted, and it's never shifted since. Everything has been moving in a direction because for the first time in my life, I didn't religiously believe. I really believed that Jesus 
is the Son of God, the Messiah, and the source of eternal life. So you got a note sheet. Hopefully you've pulled it up. At least Trent told you to pull it up at the beginning of this. And uh, I want to give you some things you might want to jot down and and some things to fill in the blank. What happens when John's purpose is fulfilled? What happens when we really, quote, believe? Not in the way we use that word, but in the way that Scripture and John and Jesus use that word. The first thing that will happen is this. We will move beyond merely believing some facts about Jesus. You see, before I had that experience on the bus of like, oh, this is real. If you'd asked me questions, who is Jesus, son of God? Did he die on the cross? Yes. Did he resurrect? Yes. Yes. I mean, I had all kinds of information that I actually believed. Kind of like we've often mentioned, you know, demon faith. The demons know that Jesus is the son of God. They know that he died on the cross and... They know he rose from the grave, and I do not expect to spend eternity with one in one of the heavenly mansions right next door to me. James put it this way, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? In other words, believing something that doesn't impact my behavior is just thinking it. Give you a little phrase you might want to jot, jot down. It's this: what we think is not the same thing as what we believe. We we make them synonymous often, but what you and I think is not the same thing as what we believe. I bet the way we use believe and think as as synonyms in our culture. I bet that you believe we should all exercise. I bet that you believe we should all eat healthy. I bet four or five of you do. I bet you believe that we should set aside money for later in life and retirement. I bet you believe, and the list could go on, and yet we do nothing with it. And what that means is we think it's probably true. We don't really believe that it is true. And, you know, Christianity has been always filled with lots of people who honor God with their lips but deny him with their actions. Jesus actually used this phrase in the the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 8. He spoke of a group of people, and he said, hey, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And the reason this is so important, this move from I think it's true to I believe it's true, it's not just some facts, it's a life-changing core of my being, is simply this. We don't have a stupid God. We don't have a stupid God. We can't kiss up to him. We can't fake him out. We can't, you know, fast talk him. He knows our heart and he knows our actions. And when our heart and our actions say this and our words say that, God responds to what we are, not what we say and what we pretend to be. But let's move on to the second thing that happens if we really believe. If we really believe, we stop worrying about our doubts and start focusing on our obedience. We stop worrying about our doubts and we start focusing on our obedience. Now, this is really important because here's what I want you to jot down and get. What we feel is not the same thing as what we believe. Just like what I think is not the same thing as what I really believe, what I feel inside is not the same thing as what we actually believe. Because biblical faith is not the absence of doubt. It's the presence of obedience. Now that's profoundly important. Biblical faith, believing in Jesus, like John is calling us to in this book we're studying, is not coming to the point that I have no doubt. It's coming to the point that I have obedience. It's not the absence of doubt. It's the presence of obedience. In fact, over and over in the Bible, God shows up in the midst of our doubts as long as they're accompanied by obedience. Let me remind you of a few stories that some of you have heard, and many of you that are brand new and following Jesus never heard before. I I have the references written out on the note sheet. One of them is is Acts chapter 12, uh, first 17 verses. Uh, The apostle Peter is is scheduled to be uh, uh, beheaded the next day, and so they gather together to pray that he would be delivered. And miraculously, he is delivered. He goes to the house where the prayer meeting is. He knocks on the door. A little servant girl named Rhoda looks and goes, ah, it's 
It's Peter. She's freaked out. She runs and tells him Peter is there. And they, what do they do? Hallelujah. Praise God. Our prayers were answered. We just were believing it to be true. No. They go, oh, crud. Rats. It must be his ghost. He's already dead. Not one of them said, ah, eh, God answered prayer. They went, oh, you just saw his ghost. And then it says, when they, he kept knocking. When she finally let him in and they saw him, it says they were astonished. I love that. They're having a prayer meeting, which is obedience, to, to seek the Lord, that which is upon their heart, which is obedience. And they don't have one ounce of confidence that it's going to be happening. They're filled with doubt, even after God answers it. See, God shows up in our doubt. We need to quit worrying about our doubts and trying to get our head all together. We just need to realize he's God. And if he's God, whatever he says and calls us to do, we need to do it, whether we understand it or don't understand it. And he'll show up. There's a story in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, of uh, three of Daniel's buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is what we know them as. And they were told they were supposed to bow down and worship an idol that had been made by King Nebuchadnezzar. And they said they wouldn't do it. So he stoked up the fires all the hotter and said, you're going to be thrown into this if you don't, this burning furnace, if you don't bow down and worship this idol that has been made of me. And I love their phrase. They said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And then they said this, the God we serve is able to deliver us. But even if he does not, I love that. Because I don't know about you, I've lived a lot of my life and, ah, my God can take care of this. And in the back of my head, I'm going, and even if he does not, he's God, so I'm going to do it. And God shows up and delivers them. There's a famous guy named Doubting Thomas later on in this Gospel of John. Uh, you know, Jesus had over and over predicted that he was going to be killed and come back to life in three days. They didn't get it. And then when he actually was resurrected and all of the other uh, apostles, except for, of course, Judas, so the other 10 had actually seen him. Here's what it says. They told him, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, hallelujah, I knew he would do it. No. They said, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, well, unless I see the nail marks on his hands and put my fingers where his nails, the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. So we'll read on when we come to that passage and find Jesus showed up and struck him dead. No. Jesus showed up and showed him his hands and his feet and his side. See, the Bible says a mustard seed of faith can move a mountain, metaphorically, obviously. And what was a mustard seed? The tiniest thing they knew. The Bible really doesn't worry about our doubts. Satan loves to make us think that our doubts, our confidence, our positive thinking is how God judges us. No, it's our obedience. And if I believe he's a Messiah, the son of God, and the source of eternal life, then even when I have no idea what in the world he's asking me to do, I'll do it because Jesus isn't asking us to be optimistic or confident. He's asking us to believe that he is God in the flesh. And if you I believe that he has got in the flesh. When he says jump, I'm going to ask how high on the way up. If I believe he's a rabbi and he says jump, I'm going to kind of look where I am and whether that makes sense. If he's a cosmic consultant, I'm going to say I'll take that into consideration. But if he's God, which is John's whole point, I'll do what he says. And that leads to the third thing. If we really believe we do what Jesus says even when it doesn't make sense. I don't worry about how I feel. I worry about how I obey. And I simply go to the point where I trust God enough to do what he says, whether I feel like it, whether I think it won't work, because he's God. I want to be really clear about this. <clears throat> the fact that he is God is enough to determine my obedience and actions. That's it. And I just want to be honest with you. There have been so many times in my life where the only reason I did something was because I believe he's God and he said to do it. There have been lots of things in my life. I, I said, when I do this, it's not going to work out. Sure enough, it didn't work out. 
there's been plenty of times where I go, this makes absolutely no sense. This won't work. This will backfire on me. All kinds of different things. But when I believe he's God and he's spoken clearly, not some crazy thought that comes in because of the pizza I ate last night. But when he has spoken clearly, I do what he says. And in a few moments, we're going to look at some of these examples of very practically, what do I mean by that? Because when we do what he says, we have proof that we actually know him as who he is. 1 John 2, 3 to 4, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Anybody says, oh, I know Jesus, I know God, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Truth isn't in him. How do I know? Oh, I really love God, man. I just, I, I just so love God. Jesus said simply, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. <laughs> it's not about how I feel as I press into God. I'm, I might feel close to him. I might feel a million miles away. I might have this incredible confidence that, man, he's going to come through, or I may be so certain that he won't come through that when he comes through, I don't believe it. It doesn't matter. Because it's all about understanding this most core truth, the most important truth of all in life. He's a Messiah. He's a son of God, and he's a source of eternal life. So here's what I want to do now. I'm going to move from preaching to meddling, if you'll let me. And I want to put some wheels on this. Okay, if I really believe, then I'll move from facts to, you know, down here. I, I won't worry about doubts. I'll worry about obedience. I'll even do it when it makes no sense. Oh, that, that all makes a nice little set of notes. But here's some tough questions. I like to ask myself, and I'm going to ask you. Because they reveal if Jesus is simply a rabbi, a spiritual teacher, uh, a cosmic consultant, or whether I understand he is the God of the universe, the creator of this universe, the one who holds all things together in this universe. Let's think of some areas. First of all, let's think, let, let me put a few things up here on the board. <coughs> uh, let's think about my response to others. You do me evil. How do I respond? Now, if you're a brand new Christian, <laughs> you know, well, I'm going to teach you a lesson. But if you walk with Jesus a little while and you actually heard what he said, and these are his words, we're to return good for evil. Now, I'm not asking when you do me a little evil, a little annoyance, do I give you back good? No, when you do evil, do I return evil, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as the Old Testament law said? Or do I believe Jesus is God, and even when it makes no sense, that I'm going to return good for your evil? Am I willing to forgive in the same way I want to be forgiven. Because, you know, that's what Jesus said. It wasn't advice. A lot of us treat us that way. He says, you're going to be forgiven in the same way that you forgive others. I think in a lot of situations, my response to others is, Lord, I want you to forgive me when I do little tiny things wrong, like I forgive others when they do little tiny things wrong. But I want you to just blast me when I... No, I don't think most of us want that, do we? It's a great picture of those who really do evil. How do I respond? It's a great picture of my life, those who hurt me deeply, the yeah buts, the exceptions of my life. That's where I find out, do I really believe he's God when he says I'm going to be forgiven as I forgive? Simple, simple little test. How do I respond to others? It will reveal that. Another one has to do with my decisions. When I make a decision, is that decision made in light of eternity or in, made in light of tomorrow? I'm talking the big decisions. My bet is right now, 
watching and listening to me that some of you have some major life decisions right in front of you. And my question is this, on the ones with big consequences, are you making that decision in light of its impact tomorrow and then the coming days? Or are you making that decision in light of eternity? Because it'll lead to two different decisions, even going back to my response to others. Because giving good for evil in the short run can just mean I lost. Forgiving the unforgivable, which doesn't mean, by the way, that I invite you back to Thanksgiving or, or you have my trust or, or, you know, well, here's what was left in my wallet after you took everything. No, no. Forgiving means I just quit going after you. I leave it to God. You've got to earn my trust again. You, you've got to earn certain things. But forgiveness, I can give that in an instant. But I won't if I'm thinking of the short term. I will if I'm thinking of the long term. Another area is my sexuality. Has that been offered to God? Because the Bible has some very clear parameters about our sexual expression. When, where, and with who. And our culture has a million, million reasons why the Bible is outdated and goofy. And you know what? Living in this culture, I get it. It does seem at times outdated and rather goofy, unless, unless the one who gave me those standards is the one who created sexuality, who created this universe, is the one who is actually God, not just a rabbi from the past. It changes everything. Let's be honest with our behaviors. Am I excusing something I know is wrong? The very fact I'm excusing that which I know is wrong tells me I don't really believe he's God. I haven't yet got John's message. And the next one is what about my money and possessions? Does God's kingdom get first? Because I'm eternally minded? Or does he get the leftovers? Am I living my life like a little kid who takes every bit of allowance and goes out and buys bubble gum and candy? Or am I living my life like I actually understand there's a whole lot more to come? And a little change of priorities today will make a huge difference later. You know, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom and its righteousness, and all of these other things will come your way. Now, granted, generally in this life, but sometimes not in this life. Do I believe God said that? Do my actions reflect that? Or was it merely good advice? And the list goes on, but the sermon must end. John chapter 6, 70 some odd verses in that chapter. We look just at the first 29, two famous stories, but John doesn't use them as we would normally use them. He uses them for his primary purpose, and I leave you with it again, that we would understand this most important truth. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and the source of eternal life. And when we get it, we don't suddenly get a robust theological understanding of life. Everything changes. And just like then today, there's many in the crowd who walk away. Ah, this is a hard saying. But those upon whom God is at work, we look and we go, yeah, it's a hard saying. But who else? can I turn to? For you are the Son of God, the creator of this universe, the one in whom we find all that we have been made to be, not just today, but forever. Father, I just ask that you would take these things and you would speak to our hearts in very practical ways And this whole process of believing would be an area of growth in our life. 
For Lord, we understand it doesn't happen overnight. There's, there's a little belief, a confirmation, greater and greater belief. But would you, through the power of your spirit and the role of our submission, bring us more and more in line with what John is trying to teach us and with the reason you said out of all the things that were written about you, this is one to be printed and put in your library that we call the Bible, the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Another amazing message in the book of John. And for all of our latest Easter information, please go to our website and click on the information that's going to be pertinent to you. Come celebrate with us this coming Easter. Have a great week, everyone.